Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to study your words. We pray that you will send your spirit to be with every one of us who are here today and those who will be watching this afterwards. Help us to glean the truth from your word that you would like us to know. And may learning the truth develop a love for truth and a, more, a greater love for you as we prepare to meet your son when he returns, which is very soon. We pray these things with thanksgiving in Jesus' precious name. Amen. amen. All right. We are on lesson number 10. Lesson number 10 is a final on the series in 2 Peter. But today is probably going to be the second to last lesson. And the, we're going to be looking at verse, question 10 to 17. Let me bring it up on the screen. And we could title this lesson, The Peace and Joy in the Life to Come. We did question number nine last week, but let's pick up from question number nine. And then we move on to the other question. Question number nine had said... What change will be wrought in the righteous ones who are now afflicted? Today, we have many people that are suffering affliction. We all are suffering affliction one way or the other. But Isaiah 35, 5 and 6 has some word of comfort for us. Would somebody tell me or go ahead and read that so that we can see what will happen to the righteous who are now afflicted? Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. Yes. And the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful to know? You know, you may know somebody, or maybe you yourself, you know, have some infirmities dealing with. You're having some eye problems? We won't need glasses, Sister John, Sister Mary, and, sister, and Brother John. We won't need these things anymore. Brother Donovan, no glasses needed. Those who are having or hard of hearing or are totally deaf, our ears will be open. Those who say, I can't sing, they're going to be able to sing. They can't speak. They're going to be given speech. Those are some of the joys that are ahead of us. Question number 10, and those who can't walk, you're walking right now and there's pain. There are some people can't even walk at all. You know, they are laid up in bed. One of these days, they're going to be able to skip and hop and jump and leap for joy, praising God, praising the father and his son. And that day is very soon. What? Question number 10, what is said of the peace and quiet of the land? There are several scriptures here on the screen. And if you would start looking them up, so by the time we reach those questions, we are ready to go. Somebody's ready to read. What is said of the peace? You know, Sister Yelene talked a little bit about her trip to Egypt. And she has some more story to tell us that she was there and she see planes look like war planes, whatever is going overhead. We won't have to worry about that. Or will we have to worry about that? Isaiah 32, verse 17 and 19. And then we're going to look at Isaiah 54, verse 13 and 14. And then 60, verse 18. What is said of the peace and quiet of that land? Does somebody have Isaiah 32, verse 17? Okay, it's Isaiah 32, verses 17 and 19. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. 19. When it shall hail coming down on the forest, and the city shall be low in a low place. All right. And verse 18. Read verse 18 as well. Oh, and my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, and in short dwellings, and in quiet resting places. There are so many times when I remember growing up, where I grew up, I grew up in Waterhouse in Jamaica, and especially the area where I live, in the nights during certain times, election times, you would hear gunshots, and you don't know if it's going to come through our house. We live in one of the houses that the bullets could come through the house, could come through the window, and as a child, I remember going onto my bed. I don't even know if my parents knew that I was doing that because they were in their room. I'm on a brother white. You know what we're talking about? 
because you know you used to hear gunshot people running on your roof and you just don't know how can you sleep in that situation for me as a child that was a traumatic thing but that's something that you kind of learn to live with you know you say your prayers at night and it could be your last prayers because you don't know what's going to happen we will be resting in peace the next one um isaiah 54 verse 13 and 14 Sister Donna, you want to grab that? Yeah, I'll read that one. Isaiah 54, 13 and 14. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. All in righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Amen. There's going to be peace. There's going to be freedom from oppression. Who is going to be in heaven or the earth made new to oppress us? No one. No one. What a joy that is going to be. Today, as we think about the, 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 the joy and peace that is in the life to come, I want our imagination to run away with that. What is going to be like in heaven? That's some things we can make our imagination run away on. Not an earthly thing. Not on the vain imaginations of this earth. But on the life that God and his son have in store for us. And we are told, eyes have not seen nor ears heard the things which God has in store for those who love him. Mm -hmm. So let us think, let's imagine those of us who have had experience in our life where we have undergone oppression, where we have undergone things where um, there are terrors, there are reason to fear. Know that a time is coming when that shall not be. And these are things we need to think about now because, you know, Sister Yelaine mentioned we, um, those in the United States here have relative peace. And relative peace, per se, but there are communities that are torn with violence and crime and people can't go out on a particular night. But it's going to get worse as we approach the coming of our Savior. Things are going to get hard for Christians, things are going to get hard for people who are standing up for truth. It's going to get harder because Satan is right now. He's making his winding up to make his last ditch effort to have us thrown into despondency, to have us fearful. And his tactics right now, he doesn't, he is going to not just involve the people of the world but he's going to have people who call themselves christians he's going to have christians linking up with the government of the various land lands to oppress the people who are standing up for god and truth and there is going to be terror and there is going to be oppression and there is going to be all of that but whatever we are going to go through we know that we are not alone and yes we're going to feel pain yes we're going to feel pangs of hunger yes some of us are probably going to be caught thrown in jail thrown in prison some of us may even lose our lives but we know in this life this is not all it for us we are looking forward to the life ahead that god has in store for those who love him Isaiah 60, verse 18. Can someone read that, please? I can read that. Thank you. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gate praise. Amen. Yes. So no more violence will be heard in the land. What a day that will be. There are many people that this is so needed right now and even if we are not experiencing it right now as i mentioned before the day is coming that we're going to need scriptures like this to let us know there is a time coming there is a day coming when it will be peace when it will be joy when you know you don't you go into your home you don't have to lock 16 locks to feel safe you don't need windows you don't need i mean what a joy that will be what a joy that will be how will people, question number 11, how will the people stand related to the great source of wisdom and peace? How will people stand? And please free, anybody, before we go on to how will people stand, anybody have any comment on what we have talked about in terms of, you know, the oppression, the freedom from oppression, the freedom from violence, the freedom from all of this? Anybody have any thoughts or any experience that they'd like to share? 
Go thing. ahead, Sister Yelaine. Yeah, I think now that we can do what we are doing right now as far as studying the Bible and stick to the words, it's time for us to do as much as we can and keep in our mind, in our head, everything we have learned because one day we'll come well, well, we won't have this opportunity anymore to connect with each other. But if we have it in our memories, plugged in, reserved, one day we will be able to call when we cannot reach each other, but we, we will call up what we have learned together and reminiscence on that so we can continue praising God and waiting for his coming as he promised that he will be coming back for us. Something that we should be doing. Keep on studying, continuing in the faith, and trust God that He will be there for us at all times. So you know, some of the things you have said, Sister Yelaine, there are places right now in the earth where some we can't share some material. There are some places where you can't watch certain videos. Where you know, brother, the brother from China was sharing with us that mm -hmm. you know the restrictions that they have. You're right. Soon there will be even more restriction because, as it, as it is said. Truth is the new hate speech. Uh -huh. You're speaking truth. You're speaking hate, according to them. When you used to read and you, you read about, okay, they're going to call light darkness and darkness light. It mm -hmm. was just like a saying. But now we're living it. We're seeing where if you are speaking the truth and if you say this is the way and it is truth, majority of the world are saying something opposite to make you feel like, question yourself, am I the one that, you know, What's wrong with, is something wrong with me, you know? Yeah, so I believe with you, Sister Elaine, you know, we have a saying, I don't know if they say it here in the United States, in Jamaica, we just say, make hay while the sun shine. Do what we can, as much as we can, while we can, in times of peace. This work is going to finish, whether in peace or in trauma and war, let's do as much as we can now. Because... I mean, even when in troublous time, we're going to be preaching, but we're going to be hedged in so much. So let's do the best we can, as you say, make ourselves available to God to be used of him to share the good news of what lies ahead. Question number 11. How will the people stand related to the great source of wisdom and peace? Isaiah 54 Verses 13, somebody find Revelation 21, verse 3 and 4, and then Revelation 22, 3 and 4. So Isaiah 54, verse 13. Will somebody read that, please? Oh, we read that already, referred to it before, but let's read it again. Yes. Isaiah 54, verse 13. Mm -hmm. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Amen. You know, as I'm reading this and I'm like, okay, all our children will be taught of the Lord. When we go to heaven, there are still things that we are going to be learning. We are going to be learning. Our children are going to be learning. And we might say, somebody here might be watching this that's saying, my children will be taught of the Lord in the new earth. But my children are so worldly. They're out in the world. They don't know Jesus. But you know what? God loves your children more than you do. And you know, as parents, parents some, one of some of the first things we like to do is blame. And one of the first things we love to blame is ourselves. Man, I should have done this better. I should have done that better. And maybe my children would not be the way they should. As parents, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. But I tell you this, I've seen parents who quote unquote follow the blueprint and still struggle with their children. You can find... And I don't want to sound sacrilegious, but you can't find a better parent than God. Look what Adam and Eve did. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this to encourage parents who are consistently beating up themselves because, and I was talking to somebody this week, beating themselves up because of their failures. Yes, we need to repent of the failings as God brings them to our minds because some of us, and myself included, you know, I've done things as a Christian that I shouldn't. Like, buy a game set. Why am I buying, it's not Nintendo or whatever that is. Why am I doing that for my child? I'm setting up my child for a failure and then I'm going to reap the consequences. 
But God understands, say God understand, God forgives that we do things at times in our ignorance. And we can't take back the past, but we can redeem the time. We can confess and repent to God. We can apologize to our children and we can trust God to save them. When Adam and Eve, the first children on earth, they were adult children. So they weren't like the two-year-old, three-year-old. They were brought, bought, um, made with adult mindset, pure mindset. They chose to walk away from God. It wasn't God's fault. They chose to walk. They chose to listen to another voice. But you know what? The, the, the most blessed and holy and reverend parent did? He went after them. He went after them. He made provision for their salvation. And when we see our children out there, for those of us who are on earth right now, one is grieving because of the position of our children. We read things in Isaiah that tell us our children will be taught of Lord and the earth made new, but they're not even going to go there because they are so sinful today. We can pray for them and we should be praying for them. When do you stop praying for your children? Brother White, when should a parent stop praying for their child or their children? Do you have that answer, Brother White? There is never a time that we should ever stop praying for our children. Amen. But, you know, if there is a time, and I tell myself, in a sense, there is a time for me. I will stop praying for my children when breath leaves my body and I have no more breath. Yeah. Or when breath leaves their body and they have no more breath. Mm -hmm. If they die, that's it. It's sealed. The rest is in God's hand. Or if I die, that's it. But between those times, we pray constantly. And we claim the promises of God. The same Isaiah that tells us that our children are going to be taught of the Lord in the earth made new has told us in Isaiah 49. And I'm going to read verse 25. Can I, I say I, something? Yes, go ahead, brother. Yeah, back to what you just said a while ago. Mm -hmm. There could be a time because I remember the story of Joshua with Achan. And God says it's not a time for, for praying now. It's time to go and seek out the sin and get rid of it. Yes, but you know, what we're saying that in terms of praying for our children's salvation, unless God tell you to stop, you don't stop. Right? right? So you right. pray. So what do we do in the meantime? We don't beat them over their head with the Bible. Sometimes every time you talk to them, you're preaching praying. to them. That's not the way to go. You live the life. You pray for them. When they open the doors, you know, you plant seed when you can, but you don't go preach and whatever. You pray. You stay on that porch like that father with open arms, running out to meet them when they come back. And you claim the promises in Isaiah 49, verse 25. It says, but thus said the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contended with thee and I will save thy children. The Lord here is telling us that he's going to save our children. Are you going to believe that? And are you going to be claiming that? I'm going to be claiming that. At the end of the day, we will know that God has done everything possible to save our children. And we can, you know, sometimes you look at them and you see them in a particular way. They are probably not what you want them to look like. They're probably not, but you don't know what's going in their heart between them and God. And even it, it doesn't matter how they, they die. You leave the final analysis and judgment to God. We serve a mighty and merciful God. He's abundant in mercy. God is so merciful. You go through the Old Testament and yes, you might see, okay, wipe out this, the, the children of this part, kill the whatever. But you see in his dealing with people, he is abundantly merciful. It's not his will that any should be lost. His will is that all should come to repentance, is that all should be saved. He made a very expensive sacrifice to make sure that would happen. But you claim this promise. Even the lawful captive will be de delivered. Satan will come and say, no, this one is mine because he did this and did that. No, you can say, look here. God has legal rights to the souls of our children, not even if they are not praying. We're saying, Lord, we give them to you. And we're claiming your promise in Isaiah 20, uh, 49, verse 25, that you will contend with the devil who is trying to contend. You will contend with whoever is contending with me, and you're going to save my children. So all our children shall be taught of the Lord, and we can look forward to this, and we can have joy now. 
We can have joy at this prospect now, even though our eyes may not be seeing the fruition of what this is saying. It doesn't even look like they're going in this direction, but God says he will do that. So we believe it and we look forward to that time when that will be a reality. Revelation 21, verse 3 and 4. Did somebody find that? May I? Go ahead. Can I start with verse 1? Because the whole thing is so beautiful, if you don't mind. Uh, okay, think, go ahead. Wonderful. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven has, and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and there shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Yes. Amen. We are waiting for that. We are waiting. We are longing. Amen. This verse, I'm so glad that you read from verse one, Sister Yelaine. As it says, we saw a new heaven and a new earth. We yes. want a new atmospheric heaven. We want, you know, just this week, somebody shared um, something with me on video that lawmakers in Tennessee is passing a bill. They want a law to be passed in Tennessee that they stop spraying the skies. They want a law that there can be no cloud seeding, that they would stop putting up chemicals. No, it's interesting that lawmakers are saying this because there is the other people who used to say, no, that's not happening. There's no such thing as chemtrail. Well, whether there is or not, the fact that they're trying to pass a law for it not to happen, it kind of means that it probably was happening. You know, and I do pray that that law does come through because the things that we're hearing that's been sprayed, some stuff with aluminum and different things, it's no wonder so many people are sick. You know, we hear of, we talk about in some of the other scriptures that we read in Isaiah, where it talked about the terrors and what's going to happen. So many tornadoes and floods and all of these things are happening. I am convinced I believe that some of these things are man-made. Some of these things are man-made, you know? Well, are demon-made. Because Satan is the one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. There are a lot of things that have been sent up into the, the atmospheric heaven that, one, can be useful to society. We get internet, so we're able to talk. But then they have things where they're able to spy. And there's just so many things to be concerned about with what's above. There are so many things to be concerned of with what's in the earth right now. I tell you, when I walk out my front door, when I was living in the city, I don't remember. I know I prayed before I left my house and I prayed when I sit in my car. But I don't remember praying, just walking, just opening the door and stepping out. <laughs> no, I have to do that because I'm like, Lord, please don't let me see any snakes. As I'm putting my hands in the strawberry patch, I'm like, Lord, please don't let anything bite me. There are just so many things to be concerned about on this planet. I am looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. And as we discussed it in some lessons before, the new heavens is not talking about the heavens of heaven where Jesus lives with his father. It's talking about the atmospheric heaven, the things that men, human beings have touched and polluted with our sinfulness. Everything that reminds with the trace of sin and evil will be destroyed and will be made new. You know, sometimes you plant some gardens and it's beautiful. Don, I know you have your beautiful flowers and you believe, and I do believe also that those are some beautiful, fantastic flowers, but we haven't seen fantastic looking flowers yet. You know, when you think of the level of care that you have to put in, 
to get those flowers to look the way they are, we're gonna be walking in greens that will always be green. Picking, can you imagine you picking flowers for your vase and they never die? I mean, we can't picture that in our mind. I don't know what that is. The closest thing to that is fake flowers and the fake flowers can't touch the real flowers. You know, um, um, it's just a lower minds to run wild looking you know, ahead, what could it be? Or what must it be to be there? Was it that song where the audience sang last week? I don't remember, the city so holy and clean. I mean, it's just, I long for that place. I long for that land. I long to be there. There's a lot of things I don't understand. How it's gonna work? How is this gonna happen? Because we live in limited, our, our minds are limited. We live in a certain time frame. This, we are everything of a start and an end in where we are, in our minds. But we are going to go beyond time. We're going to go beyond time. And this verse here comes down one. It's verse three. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now we hear of unfallen worlds. And please feel free to jump in and come in. Let me know when you want to speak. We speak of unfallen worlds, worlds that have never fallen. I don't know what the beings are called on those worlds. But God is going to tabernacle with us. God is going to live with us. He will dwell with us. We shall be his people. And God himself will wipe all tears from our eyes. I know it's going to have tears to dry from me because apart from sorrows, I'm going to be so happy that I don't know if I can stop crying in heaven. I'm just like, okay, I'm going to be so overjoyed that it's unimaginable, the joy and the fact that he has chosen these rebels, these rebels turned saints because of his mercy and he made provision and he gave the righteousness of his son and he did everything to bring us there and then he's going to dwell with us. How amazing is that? Edmund. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Talking about for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Obadiah chapter 1 and verse 4 says, Though Thou, thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and thou, thou sit thy nest, thy nest among the stars. Then will I bring thee down, says the Lord. I can imagine when the new heavens and the new earth are established, and the nests of men in the form of, of the satellites, all of them are brought to nothing. Amen. Amen. Anybody else have any thoughts? What are some of the things that you're looking forward to in the new life to come? Anybody want to share? Yeah, I'm looking forward to having a new body to be changed, to be like Jesus. Yeah. As the character of Christ is re reproduced in us, you know, I would love to have that kind of body that Jesus has. Amen. Amen. So, you know, when you talk about the character of Christ, though, we are going to be changed. This mortal shall put on immortality yeah. and the corruption shall put on incorruption. But the character of Christ, when would that be put on? No. Okay, Brother Edmund. Amen. Isaiah 66 and verse 22 says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make shall remain before me, says the Lord. So shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall pass one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. How I long to be with the Lord within that Sabbath. See, it's only begotten son that every single Sabbath we are face to face. I long for that. Amen. 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 Any other thoughts on Revelation 21, 1 to 4? You know, as, and I'm jumping down to verse 5. 
It says, and he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. I make all things new. So some of the things we talked about a little bit earlier about so many of us living with regrets. You know, man, I should have done that. I should have done that. We truly get a new slate. You know, when we accept God and we ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins, he treats us as if we have never sinned a day in our life. When we accept him, we become new creation. We become new creatures. There are folks that probably knew us back then and are good at diving. We're told that he casts our sins into the depths of the sea. And they'll want to go down there and dive it up to say, well, you know, you know, Donna, Donna used to whatever, Donna, whatever. No. If you want to stay down and dive, that's on you. God wipe it's that God has wiped your record clean. But here, even this in this new heaven, when he says he's made all things new, it's gonna be all things, all things. We're gonna have glorified bodies like Jesus. What exactly does that glorified body look like? We know after Jesus raised, when he when God raised Jesus from the dead. Um, he did go by the seaside and cook for the disciples. He did cook some things for them. Then he did enter a room and didn't, nobody saw how we entered that room. I know, would we be able to do that? You know, you'd be able to walk through what? I don't know. But what a glorified body looks like. But I don't have to know how everything works. I just need to believe what the Bible says. And when I go there, I will find out. I'm willing to wait to find out to see what that is. What I know is that we won't have the tempter around. We won't have the distraction from the enemy. We won't have any distraction from the enemy's servants. Our minds will be free to focus on God and serving him. Brother White. Yeah. You know, it's a joy just to think of it. Amen. Because the Bible is telling us that the former things... Mm -hmm. will not come into mind, will not be remembered. All of those things, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, let me tell you, if the, that is wonderful, brother, brother Raymond. You know, most people, there are things in my life that I wish never, ever had happened. There are things I wish never, that I've never voluntarily done. Yeah. You know, but, and, and the tempter and, and knows of all of those things. Because he was one of the, you know, the person, he and his imps that instigated them. And that's why during the time of when we don't have a mediator, standing mediation ceases, he will want to come and torment us to say, hey, remember, did you do this? Did you confess this sin? And trying to torment us and torture us with us trying to think, did I confess this sin? Did I give this up? Because he's going to bring back those things to our minds to torment us. But the time is coming when all things will be new. No reminder. The one reminder and trace of sin will be what? The print in the hands of the Savior. The mark in his hands where he was wounded when he was in the house of his friends. I am looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to that new city. I don't know what your lives are like. And no matter how good it is, it cannot touch the glories that lies ahead. When you think of what lies ahead, whatever joy and happiness or whatever you have today pales in comparison. Pales in comparison. So I'm thankful that God is going to dwell with us and be our God and wipe away every tear, the royals, from our eyes. Yes, I have a question. Yes. When Jesus returns, will there be any possibility of sin ever again? Anybody wants to answer that question? Yeah. I think that the freedom of choice that we now have, we will have to exercise it. In other words, God will take away that freedom of choice because we have we consent. It's not by, you know, he, he give us that choice, but we will have to reach the place where he will take the choice from us. Not that 
he is going to force himself and take it away. We have to get rid of it from now so that when we reach to that point, then we won't have a choice to sin because we would have already gone through sin, experienced what it is like, and we will never want to re ever return back to that situation. Thank you. Nahum, Can I add one? Ahead, Sister Elaine? Yes. At this moment, while we are on this earth living, we are studying, we are learning, we are facing situations. We are learning to choose. We are le learning to let go. Start with our pride and everything that is holding us behind that we are trying to get rid of. And we cling on Christ to be able to walk further away from the things of this world. But when Christ comes, we will accomplish that yes, movement, that action of leaving behind because we will be filled of Christ. And this will be the moment for us to know that we are going with him because he's coming to claim those who are his. And us clinging, staying with him, learning about him, or uh, trusting him in everything we do, that's what will help us to stay in that uh, uh, narrow way where we, we know now no choice of something that, is, that will make you go behind because you want to go further with Christ. The choice will be made and we won't have no more sins in us because Christ covers us with his shield of protection and guide us where we have to go. I don't think there will be no more sin in us to, to, to be left behind in sin. We will be going with Christ in heaven at that time. So new being with new body, new mind, new everything in us. That's what we will be when Christ comes to be able to go up. Amen. Nahum yes. 1 verse 9, the last part says, affliction shall not rise a second time. It shall not rise a second time. Mm -hmm. And also, remember, also, we're not going to have the tempter to tempt us as well. Yes. And yeah, so I'm looking forward to that time. Somebody find Revelation 22, verse 3 and 4. Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4. Yes. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Amen. Amen. A nice, you know, adding on to what we just read I, in, Revelation, I want to... in Revelation 21. Sister Nis, you want to say something? The 144,000 are not going to be sinful anymore. Due to the Lord, he's going to take all of their sins and he's going to keep them without sinning. I believe in heaven is the same thing. And until the 1,000 years are ended and Satan will die and sin and everything and death, those people are be kept by Jesus. And even after, we will be we will always be through Jesus in everything that we will do and think and say. It's now our choice to choose whether our will or his will. If we want his will, he will cleanse us and he will mold us and he will change us and he will give us to be his and we will be one body with him, united with him. Okay, thank you, Brother Keith. Brother Royals, Brother Mohinder's question is a very valid one because Lucifer was perfect and everyone was united and then iniquity was found in him. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve were created perfect, perfect mind, perfect everything, no mistakes. But then the tempter came and got them. So you have to realize that even in perfect heaven, sin was able to be found. And then even in a perfect earth, sin was able to find. So the question that Brother Mahinder raises, will this happen again? And I think, as was stated, uh, Jude 124, now to him who is able to keep you from falling. I think this is something that is not just present here, but I think it's going to carry with us for all eternity. Because when we recognize that right now we can sin almost conscious, uh, unconsciously, so easy for us to do that. We don't even think about it. 
because the Holy Spirit hasn't opened our eyes to a lot of the things that we do, even subconsciously. And as the Holy Spirit, you know, opens to us, oh, you shouldn't have done this. He's like, but that's been years and years and years of this. And we want to uh, confess all these events. But you see how sinful we are as a being. When we get to see the glories of heaven, imagine, you know, the taste and smell, uh, just the sensory overload, you know, the, the smells. Like this was the conversation we had last week. It's just going to be so overwhelming. And then we see that Jesus gave all this up and he gave up his form will always be this glorified body with the nail prints in it, mm -hmm. with the scars in it. These will be forever his. And we will know that all of that was done because he loved us. Yeah. We'll, we, right now, these are just words. But when we actually see what the, this looks like on the other side of the curtain, you know, <laughs> I think we'll be hard pressed. And I think if sin ever wants to raise its head again, it's a second time or again in the future. The, chances are probably is like, don't you guys remember what it was like to live down there? Why would we want to give that up? You know, do you want to ever do this again? And we will have visible clues. And we're not going to be like the children of Israel where they saw the deliverance of God through the 10 plagues. So they walked through the Red Sea, and yet they saw the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day, and they still couldn't think of, think of it. We're going to go through that similar experience, and this will be for the rest of eternity, but because Jesus is always going to be per, uh, uh, always uh, sustaining us. And that's why Christ in you, the hope of glory, is so key, this understanding. It's not just us that we did. Oh, yeah, we did it. No, no, no. It's humanity and divinity joining together to make this thing happen. And I have a sense that this will be a forever union that we'll always be able to, to rely on throughout the countless uh, ages of eternity. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you so much, Keith. So we have looked on the joys that are, that, that are ahead of us, that the, the, the blind eyes will be open, the deaf will hear, the dumb will talk, the lame will walk and leap. There will be quietness from peace and terror. There won't be any oppression. There will all of that. We look at God himself shall be with us and be our God and he will wipe away all tears of our eyes. And knowing all of this, question number 12, seeing we look for such glorious things when Christ come, what should we do? Second Peter 3, verse 14. We're looking for the glorious things. There are so many people that we hear and they're saying, oh, meet me by the river someday. And, you know, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. But not everybody will sing that song and whatever is going to be there. No. What should we do? Somebody read Second Peter 3, verse 14. Maybe you'll find the answer there. Somebody have that? Yes. 2 Peter 3, verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Amen. So what it says, we need to be diligent. See that we're looking forward to this glorious new life when there is hope and there is peace and there is joy. What should we do? Be diligent, not wishy-washy, not Silly. Be diligent that we may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. And what that does that look like? That looks like, right? So I'm going to make sure my dress is the right length. I'm going to make sure I'm eating the right thing. I'm going to make sure I'm... these things are not going to save us. Many times I hear, oh, present truth. You people, your dresses are too short. And this and up here. I am one for dress reform. Let me just say this. And I'm one for eating plants based diet. But so many times we put those things ahead like those are the things that's going to save us. Make sure you're keeping the right. That's not what's going to save you. The Sabbath is not going to save you. Your long dress and you eating fake meat is not going to save you. But it says I need to be diligent. How am I going to be diligent in making sure I'm with, without spot and blameless? Brother Kint hinted to Jude 24 when it says no unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Now we learned that, you know, his commandments are righteousness and we need the righteousness of Christ and God is willing to give that to us. What, where does our diligence come in? Brother Keith. So I was just having this conversation with somebody at work just yesterday. You're right. Keeping the Sabbath doesn't save us. Neither does eating right or dressing right. 
So we have to be very clear. Salvation comes by faith, through uh, by, by grace, through faith in Jesus and what he has done. That's how we are saved. Amen. And so a lot of people want to think salvation is just like the thief on the cross, where all you have to do is just claim Jesus as the Lord and Savior. And I agree that the thief on the cross is salvation is just that easy. But the thief on the cross did not get to live the next day. So this is why it talks about walking in a newness of life. Amen. So what happens is when you choose Christ, you have to then say, do I eat Christ or do I eat like the world? Do I dress like Christ or do I dress like the world? And what happens is none of those things save you. You are saved because of what Jesus has done for you and is doing in you. But you are sanctified. You are being set aside for holy use. That is why it talks about that we are a royal priesthood. We're not just anyone. We have, we're, okay, granted, okay, we're nobody. And Jesus says, you know what? I want to make you a royal priesthood. You want to do what? He wants to, he, you, you know, we don't, we're not just a normal pe a pew warmer. We are a royal priesthood when we get to heaven. And that's a high calling. And there's a certain way, there's a decorum, just like with royalty, there's a way you behave, there's an etiquette. Likewise, so some people will learn that etiquette quickly, some people will take a whole lifetime, sometimes people will have to learn that stuff in heaven. That being said, there's a certain way you ought to carry yourself as when you live in this world. That's why in John 17, Jesus talks about how his people are in the world, but not of the world. And you can tell by how you eat, by how you dress, and how by you act. So uh, again, in summation, it's those things don't save you. Rather, it shows that you have been saved and you're working towards that sanctification that God wants to work in each one of us. Well, thank you, Keith. And I want to add to this, because when he says we are working towards, and to me, our work is to submit to Christ's leading. Because as we submit to him and surrender to him, he gets in our kitchen, he gets in our closet, he gets in everything about us. So it doesn't come like me trying to do this. It's him doing through me. No, Rob and Janine post something in the chat. It says, no is a time to prepare. The seal of God will never be placed on the forehead of an impure man and woman. That's scary. It will never be placed on the forehead of an ambitious, word-loving man or woman. Never be placed. Never be placed on, hold on, let me, let me open this wide so I can read it. It said, it will never be placed upon the forehead of the ambitious, world-loving woman. It will never be placed upon the forehead of men of false <laughs> tongues or deceitful heart. All who receive the seal must be before, uh, without spot before God. Candidates for heaven, go forward, my brethren and sisters. I can only write briefly upon these points at this time, merely calling your attention to the necessity of preparation. Search the scriptures for yourself that you may understand the fearful solemnity of the present. Oh, and that 5T, that's five testimonies, 216.2. Now that sounds really scary and it's really a solemn thing. But when you realize the burden is not on you, that makes it a whole lot different. You know, when you're thinking about you yoke up, when you yoke up with Christ, when you see how did Christ succeed? Christ came as our example to show that you can overcome. You can be overcome. How did he overcome? He overcome by the spirit of God living in him. He overcome by the word of God. How we will overcome? Christ came so that we can be partakers of his divine nature. When somebody says, oh, I did this. Oh, I'm only human. If you're only human, you're going to hell. So when I don't get me wrong now, I'm not saying that you are divine and you are to be worshipped. I'm not saying Christ has come so that we can be partakers of the divine nature. The father, Galatians 4 verse 6, and because he is our son, God has sent forth the spirit of his son to dwell in your heart, crying, Abba, Father. We can overcome not by our own strength, but by God. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can do this through Christ who strengthens me. And when we realize, no wonder when we reach that city and when the crowns are placed on our heads, we are going to take them off and we're going to lay them at the feet of Jesus because we're going to realize we do not deserve this. Because every victory that we have won, we didn't win it. Christ won it for us. 
So when we realize that the burden is on him, it makes the road a little less stressful. The problem comes is when we try to get in the way. I'm not saying, okay, live as you please. Because you know what? When he asks us to do things and when he talks to us, it's going to go against our natural inclination. We're going to want to pull the opposite direction. But when we, if we are truly surrendered, Lord, and sometimes you're going to say, Lord, I really don't feel like doing this, but you're telling me to do this. Give me the heart to surrender. Surrender. Move forward. Surrender. And I find when you surrender, even to doing things that you feel uncomfortable doing because your worldliness want to pull you this way, there is so much freedom and release in it. So don't be scared about this. Yes, it's a solemn preparation that must be done. Yes, it's serious. Because people who are worldly and all of that, the seed of God is not going to be placed on their forehead. They're not going to have the Father's name in their forehead. It's not going to happen. But he has promised that he can keep us from falling. Christ is waiting to give us his perfect character. Will we let go of our filthy rags and accept it? That's the deal. Let's, the next question is... How should we regard the fact, verse 13, how should we regard the fact that God has so long delayed the great consummation? Verses 9 and 15. I think that's that's in 2 Peter 3, verse 9 and 15. Can somebody read that quickly? And, I, and I'm watching the time and I want to stop at verse 16. So let's do this very quickly. Verse 16 or question. Question 16, I want to stop at question 16. Somebody, do you have... Second Peter 3, 9 and 15, could read quickly, please. The Lord is not slack con concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, <clears throat> but is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, and account that long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given. Unto him hath wrath hath written, sorry, unto you. So, how should we regard the fact that God so long delayed? Is because he's long suffering, he's patient, he's merciful. You know, he's merciful. He knows when enough is enough. We might say, Yes, Lord. I remember when I got baptized at the age of 10. I'm like, Lord, I wouldn't mind you versus the clouds of heaven and come tonight or tomorrow. That would be so good. But here it is, there are so many people that are still yet to be reached. Some people might say there will always be people that's going to be able to reach. But God in his wisdom will know when to draw the line. It's because of his long suffering. Uh, many of us, if he had come 20 years ago, where would we have been? Where would, which side of the fence would we be on? Five years ago, last week, you know, God is long suffering. And he is merciful. He's not willing that any of us. It's not that he's slack concerning his promise. Because if he gives a promise, he's going to keep it. He's going to fulfill it. But because he's merciful. What apostle besides Peter has said much about the second coming of Christ? And you read that, Sister Taryn. You remember who it mentioned in verse 15, the last part? Paul. It says, Paul. How extensively does Peter say that Paul has spoken of these things? Verse 15. Can 16, can you read verse 16? As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. It's interesting, you know, and before I started this lesson, I didn't realize that Paul touched on the second coming of Jesus so much. And then... It says in all of the epistles, all of Paul's writing. And then verse 17, question 17 says, so is there one of, is, verse 16 says, is there one of Paul's epistle which does not refer to the second coming of Christ and the judgment? No, it's mentioned in all. Verse 17, what epistle contains a mention of this in every chapter? And the answer is Thessalonians. And I went through First and Second Thessalonians, reading every verse and realizing that every chapter mentioned something. I mean, it was it's amazing. I went through and I'm like, man, I didn't even realize this, that Paul was so caught up with the coming of Christ, the return of Christ, that it, not only does he talk about it in every book, 
he actually mentioned it in every chapter in Thessalonians. If you have a chance, you can go through. Let me see. I'm, 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 if you have a chance, you can go through it and see. You know, see for it. Chapter one, talk about the God that they should turn. Verse nine, turn from God, from God, turn to God from idols and serve the living gentle God and wait for his son from heaven. He asked us to wait. Chapter two, verse 12 says that he should walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and to his glory. And you go, I mean, everywhere in verse 19 in chapter two says, for what is our hope and our joy and our crown of rejoicing? Are not even he in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? I says, I was going to them like Paul mentioned this every chapter, every chapter in Thessalonians something about the glorious coming and that's what we should be keeping before our eyes is that in our conversation as we speak to our friends and as we go about how often is that on our minds or do we overwhelm our minds thinking about the problems of this life and how bad this life is getting i'm not saying that we shouldn't look at the signs of the times and know what's going on that's in, that's in, that that's important too, I believe, to have an understanding of what's going on. But we should keep our eyes on the prize. I'm talking about keeping our eyes on the prize. Excuse me. I remember one quick story. Donovan would probably remember this. So they tell you when, if you have ever gone skiing, I went snow skiing once in my life, and that's gonna be it again. The only time would never do that again. But they tell you the person who was instructing, saying you need to look where you're going look where you're going so i go up to this it wasn't even so much a, a high mountain but it was a long long stretch a, a good nice slope and there were like five-year-olds just going down the ski going down passing me and i'm like man that looks so good of course they had us do a little training first and then we rode the, the thing go up to this and it's time to start slowing down you know sloping down and I'm coming down and I'm telling you, I'm going, but they said, look where you're going. I took my eyes off the end. I started looking sideways. You know what happened? I, oh, Donovan is laughing. He remember because, you know, thank God your wife is alive. I am going down the slope and I turn my head and my body turned and I couldn't stop it. I went over the slope, over the thing, up in the air, you remember? I landed on some people. Oh, I'm telling you, it's the mercy of God why I'm alive today. But it taught me a lesson. The man said, the teacher says, keep your eyes on where you are going. Keep your eyes before you. I was, I was looking at all, I'm going down and I'm doing good. I just turned my eyes I, what, what, for what felt like a moment. Just turned my head, my body went and everything. Thank God he provided human cushions for me and that the cushions remained alive after. Of course, I never went um, skiing again, but I learned that valuable lesson. I say to you today, Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on heaven. Earth is temporary. Everything here is temporary. It will be gone soon. As we, we talked about brother Ray, Raymond, God himself shall wipe all tears from our eyes. The former things will be passed away. We won't remember all the nonsense. We will just bask in the glory of the Father and the glory of His Son. We live in the presence of all the angels, the presence of the saints. We go planet hopping down. And remember, we have that plan. It's going to be a great and grand occasion. It's going to get worse before it gets better, but it's going to get better. And we look forward to that new heaven and that new earth. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time that we could study your words and to kind of like put our minds to kind of think of what you have in store for us. I know we haven't even scratched the service because you have said, I have not seen and ears have not heard the things that you have in store for those who love you. Lord, you love us so much that you have things that's going to blow our minds. We can't even comprehend it. We think of the most beautiful places and things that we have done here on earth and it cannot comprehend. You're going to have us walking on 
gold, streets of gold, looking through gates of pearl. I mean, it's just unimaginable, but we are glad that you have this prepared for us. We're glad that Jesus is there preparing a place for us right now. We are so glad that you are making up a kingdom for your son. And we're so glad that Jesus will soon be, be here to gather us from this awful place. And that your tabernacle, you're going to tabernacle with us and you will dwell with us and be our God and wipe every tears from our eyes. We look forward to that day for ourselves. We look forward to that day for those who are we are working for, that you are using us as your instrument for. We're thanking you that you're saving us. You're saving our children. We're claiming your promises. We thank you and we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.